involved in doing stuff and being physically active and understanding our physiology and so on since you know teenager when I first started being a lifeguard and first aid and just always interested in how we function what's going on in this amazing body self that we are that we have here and being amazed at how smart our bodies are so all through you know I became a fitness instructor in the 1980s with leg warmers and all those good things and involved in functional uh, functional training and movement and finding out how can we do things more easily uh, more comfortably how can we tap into our own intelligence to really guide us in this world and so through that I, I ran into the Feldenkrais stuff and for me hey, the Feldenkrais Riley, can I just ask you not to hit your your oh. uh Table? yes <laughs> otherwise it's a little jumpy okay <laughs> i get excited i'll just flip back a little hey, there you go I move the table back okay good good <laughs> out of my way <laughs> see later on when we get to this this is the sympathetic nervous system getting excited about doing stuff right sympathetic nervous system sort of activates you and it can get you into a place of excitement and readiness for things it can also take you into fight or flight you see but right now i'm excited <laughs> We can tell. <laughs> I will stop slapping my table. It was an excellent example. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So tell us about the Feldenkrais and how you found Feldenkrais. Well, the Feldenkrais stuff, I just wanted to, I wanted to move from the fitness world into something that really tapped into our own intelligence for how to learn more directly. And so somebody said, well, check out the Feldenkrais stuff. I don't know what it is, but maybe it's good. So I looked at that and I did resonate with that. So I became interested in the Feldenkrais work for a way for us um, to be able to really keep on learning, keep on making goodness for ourselves over time. And within the first month of the Feldenkrais stuff, I went to the books to go look for things and ran into a book by Linda Tellington Jones. And I bought it and I opened it up. And, if, and within two pages, it was like, well, clearly I have to learn this, right? I have to do this too. So that was that started my road into the the Tellington Touch stuff, um, and I got involved in the Tellington Touch with horses. So I'm now a practitioner of that, and then I also wanted to sort of deepen my understanding of how does our whole physiology, how does our nervous system deal with all the crazy stuff that goes on in the world? What happens when the crazy stuff lands and doesn't have a chance to move through? And that was the trauma work. So working with Kathy Kane, who's a master teacher of somatic experiencing and also now has really worked, uh, developed a, a work where we look at what happens in the body and how can we help the body to move through stuff so that we can be released, have our life, our life energy, our vitality released and liberated for good stuff. And this for me resonates for us as humans and it resonates with animals that we work with because uh, if we're shut down, if something's holding us back, then some of that vitality, that capacity to learn and engage and be interested and perform well is tampened down. So it's, um, for me, I'm really interested in how do we help that open up again? How do we get that flow going? And how do we tap into the goodness of our own selves to guide us through this stuff? So today, we're talking a bit about how to um, how to use our own body intelligence and how to tap into it with the animals we work with in order to help calm in ways that are truly calm. And the difference between calm, which is really a good place, you know, the happy place calm, versus something that looks kind of calm, but it's actually a freeze state. So being able to distinguish between those and then help ourselves come into the place that's the calm that really is an all is well state, a, a place that opens us up for goodness. So Violet, I just thought I'd share a little bit of this live on Facebook because I know that this is such an interesting talk and I really wanted people to hear a little bit more about it. So I hope you don't mind, but I've just put it up live on Facebook. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and forth between screen share and then coming back to seeing real people. But I'll go over to screen share just to start here. And I think, I think you guys can see, on Zoom anyways, you can see the little people screens too, if you want to see me yep. and Wendy. But here's me and my horse. I have a big black Canadian mare who has lots of opinions about everything and she's very enthusiastic and she's just like me, my husband says. 
in those ways, right? So she is my, we walk through a lot of stuff in life together. And um, I will just go here. So a little bit of background that I want to do. I've got four slides or six slides that are kind of about the science of this stuff. And then we'll go into how to bring about, how to tap into the calm places in yourself or help your horse to do that. So we'll do the practical stuff after I do a little bit of sciencey stuff here. And Wendy is going to jump in and help me out at various places as we go along. We're making this up as we go, eh? Yeah, so. well, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> so within the nervous system, with especially the nervous system of mammals, I'm going to be talking about. So mammals are like humans, dogs, cats, bunnies, um, mice, like any, anything that um, needs to raise its young and lactates to feed, feed some milk. So there's a lot of animals that are, are mammals. And I'm talking about mammals because mammals have a very different kind of parasympathetic nervous system, which I'll mention at the bottom of the slide. But the nervous system that we're going to talk a bit about today, or that's regulating the stuff we're talking about, is our autonomic nervous system. So it's not the voluntary nervous system where I'm going to reach for this and push a button or get my glass of water. That's voluntary, so I can choose to do it or walk down the street. The autonomic nervous system is the nervous system that runs in the background. It keeps us alive. It keeps your heart beating and it manages your blood pressure. It takes care of your breathing. Some aspects of the autonomic nervous system we can manage um, like voluntarily as well, but when we're not thinking about it, it's going on anyways. And the autonomic nervous system has two main branches. One is the sympathetic nervous system, right? The one that gets me all excited to be here. And it's the one that fires us up for action. And it can fire us up for action in a way where we feel excited and safe and good and that feeling safe place. We're at, you know, action in a feeling safe place. And then there's also, if things don't feel safe, it can help take care of danger by firing up the fight or flight responses. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. The parasympathetic nervous system slows things down. So we've got one nervous system that speeds things up, and the other one that kind of puts a damper on things, puts the brakes on, helps to slow things down. Now, the interesting thing about mammals, so you know, horses, cats, dogs, us, is that we have two big branches of the main nerve, that's the, the biggest nerve in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your vagus nerve, your vagal, your vagus, the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve. When it, the vagus. <laughs> Some people like vagal, and we have between vagal and vagus, and I, I I think both are correct, but we do tend to switch back and forth. I haven't figured out which one's the best. No, one, one is a, an adjective, and the other one is the noun. So the vagus oh. nerve is the nerve, okay. but because there's two branches of it, um, the fellow who figured out there was two branches, his name is Dr. Stephen Forges, and he developed the polyvagal theory. So it's a theory about two vagus nerves, more than one, right? Poly. And the interesting thing about the vagal, the polyvagal thing is that the two branches are quite different. And there's a newer one that's developed, that developed only in mammals, which is the one that helps us sort of problem solve and be interested in things and be nuanced about how we respond to life. And then there's the older dorsal vagus nerve, which goes more down into the gut. The ventral vagus nerve tends to be centered in the upper, upper chest, in the chest. And the dorsal vagal nerve is more centered down in the gut, although they have a little bit of branches into either. The older dorsal vagal system was the one that was really important for staying alive. It's a survival response. And it helps slow things down in order to deal with a really dangerous situation or when you really need to just slow things down, like when you're hibernating and doing things like that. Um, so the dorsal vagus nerve is the one that regulates what's called the freeze response, which is the danger response uh, when you need to slow down due to danger. The newer ventral vagus will help you slow down when you're feeling safe. It will take care of things and take you into the goodness of slowing down. How are we doing so far? Haven't hit my table recently. <laughs> So in this slide, there's sort of two differentiated states that I want to talk about. One is when you're feeling safe, when all is well. 
And so you get to be in a state where you have excitement and you have a calming and an up and down state. So you actually end up having, I'm just going to go to the next slide and then come back. There is this range that you can be within, a normal range where you might get excited and your sympathetic nervous system takes you, you know, into the action mode. And then you calm down afterwards. And this is called the rest or digest place and it's all within the range in which you feel safe. And the term in the, the trauma literature and so on is that this is the window of tolerance. It means your body is pretty happy in this state, all is well, things are functioning well, your biology is functioning well, and can recover well in this state. And it's the state in which you can do stuff without triggering the fight, flight, or freeze responses. All right, I just want to go back now. When you don't feel safe, so when something happens where you're overwhelmed or you get frightened or it's just too much, um, or there's too much too soon, any of those kinds of things where you just, you, your, your body just kind of doesn't feel quite safe anymore. At that point, your biology kicks in. And so it's your older systems, not the newest vagus nerve, but the older vagal nerve, the old, dorsal vagus, um, and your sympathetic nervous system in the fight flight response, response to deal with the sense of danger. And in the freeze state, this is different from the, how people often talk about the parasympathetic nervous response, because this is not the rest and digest. It looks calm, but it's actually something different. And there's a lot of stress chemistry going on in the background. So this is where you get sort of a shut down look or manner in the person or the horse. There's sort of a sense of numbness or flatness. Um, and you may get a sense of just going through the motions. And, there can be a whole spectrum in here because um, Robin Hood actually from Tellington Touch said, well, this can go anywhere from slush to deep freeze, right? Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's very true. You can be, a lot of us spend a lot of time in slush phase. If we're in a situation that feels kind of tense, I might just sort of keep myself going, put a lid on it, keep myself going. And then afterwards I get out of it. It's like, <sighs> I call it airplane mode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like when you I mean, go to the airport, you just have to click into airplane mode. Otherwise, there's no point. If the plane's late or it's delayed or mechanical, there's no point. So just stay in airplane mode. <laughs> just kind of, yeah, just kind of deal with it. And then afterwards, you can, you can sort of come out of it. And the thing is, it's meant to be this, these unsafe response, these uh, safe, the responses in unsafe times are meant to be temporary. But, okay, so just going. So the safe things here, the safe state is the state that helps with learning with horses, for example, if uh, when the way that the Tellington Touch <laughs> try, you know, teaches how to prepare a horse to be ridden, by the time you finally get on the horse, it's, it's about as exciting as watching grass grow, right? Like that's the intent. That's what we're aiming for. It's something and where not it's freeze, just relaxed. Just relax. They're with you. They're attentive. They're okay with what's going on. It's just the next natural step to kind of going, hmm, okay, that's all right. Right? And so there's no freeze and there's no rodeo. Right. Right? Because the rodeo so often a, is the next step that, after freeze. That may be in a slushy or freeze state. They might be standing still when you get on, but it's when you ask for that first step. They either can't move or explode or, you know, they're, it's not just a, oh, I can just walk forward. It's a... It's a very yeah. different response, especially. That's right. Yeah, so you really, it's important to know that, sort of learn the signals and learn the difference. So that you know whether you've got a horse who's just waiting for the next step and it's all okay, or you've got a horse when you ask them to do something, they might, they might become dangerous, right? Not because they're trying to be bad horses, it's just because they got to do something in their stay safe response, in their danger response. Um, so this is uh, a lovely photo of Shiner who's a Mustang, who is clearly now not a wild Mustang. <laughs> but this is him with the Surefoot stuff. And what I love about the Surefoot stuff is that it offers a way to create a safe environment for horses to check stuff out. They get a lot of say about what's going on. And they get to be in an experience that for them feels safe. And we have a whole webinar with Robin Hood looking at Shiner. So if you go back to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, you can find this webinar and see the progression of Shiner from a shutdown place, um, just not, not gonna explode, but just 
not present, not engaged, not interested in what we were doing, to becoming extremely curious and chasing me around because he wanted to get on pads. So we used that to improve his trot. I just made the pads in a circle and it was like musical chairs. He wasn't chasing me. He was actually chasing the pads and where I was walking, he would trot on over to there to get on a pad. So it yeah. changed them dramatically from a sullen, rather withdrawn, uh, unengaged horse to a very curious and interesting horse. Yeah, and I wouldn't say he was sullen so much as he was just, he knew his job and he was going through the motions. Yeah, yeah. So he was what a lot of horses will do. They know their job. They know they kind of have to do this. They do it. But, you know, if you got my mare doing that thing, my mare gives me the look of, fine, I'll do it, but I won't pretend I like it. Right? Shiner is much more gracious. Yeah. He just kind of does his thing, right? In the past. Yeah. yeah. And also horses in the wild need this kind of place to come back to, right? This kind of all is well state is the one where they can respond when they need to and then get back to grazing. What happens in our physiology when things get scary or overwhelming? Well, at that point, we start to feel unsafe and that's when the bio biology kicks in. So looking at that little model that I had, this is our normal range where everything feels safe. But if something kicks up higher, we get really activated in a fight or flight response. And at that point, depending on the level of fear or fight or flight, the nervous system is busy, busy with survival. So at that point, the relating that goes on with the horse changes because the horse is kind of like, right? yeah, I that's nice, I don't want to I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> right and it's and their ability to be with you and really perform well and so on is really limited because they are already their whole nervous system on the inside is running stress chemistry it's making sure that they can stay alive it's the bg song mm, 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 mm. stay alive that dates alive. you that does right? date you. i know that song you know that song i know that song yeah. yes and so if you imagine them kind of doing this and singing that song while they're trying to listen to you, you can imagine that, you know, the whole relationship and the capacity to perform and their ability to connect and all those things is different than when they're in the all is well state and they're kind of going, oh, hi, hi there, you know? And then you can either go up in that fight or flight or drop down too low further out of the safe zone and that becomes the freeze. And the freeze will often kick in after fight or flight can't work. You know, like if they can't get away, then what are they going to do? They're going to end up, you know, where's the photo? It's back. The poor little puppy in the corner. That oh, guy, yeah. right? It said, like, I can't do anything. I just shut down and stay here and wait and see what happens. Hopefully I'm alive at the end. Right? So we have a question, and I, I'm not sure that you can answer it, um, but I'll ask it. Um, do horses lose their hearing and peripheral vision as people do when in fight and flight? I don't know that for sure, but I know the focus changes. The muscle tight, uh, muscles tighten, uh, the softness uh, is different. They don't have the same amount of softness and we get sort of tunnel vision when we're like that, mm -hmm. right? And we also can't, we, we don't notice as much around us when we're in um, a fight or flight or freeze response. So my guess is that that's true, but I don't know that, yeah. And the key thing is that if something gets stuck, either in fight or flight or in freeze, that can happen. So instead of being a temporary visit to those places as a good you know, survival response, it can be really useful to be able to do fight or flight and get the heck out of a bad situation or to do freeze to be able to sort of get through something that you need to be numb for, is it numbed out or is it, it helps you get through it. But if you stay there, there's a big cost in your physiology, cost of, it's a cost of doing business inside your biology. And it can affect your health, it can affect your digestion, it can affect the horse's digestion, it can affect a lot of things going on because we never get a chance to really get back into this all is, all is, all is well zone, which is the place you need to be to actually rest, to be able to immobilize in a way that feels safe and feels good and get real restoration going on. So I'm just going to come out for a sec. How are we doing? Great. We're doing great. You know, it just makes me think of, um, for me, um, 
one one day I was doing a Surefoot webinar and I did not hit the record button. And I actually I I realized I hadn't hit record just before you started to do your intro. Um, but that whole I did the whole webinar without record and I was so stressed. I went out into my garden, but it took me hours to come back down from that anxiety. Yeah. And, you know, I went out in my garden, which is the place that is so restorative for me because, you know, if I kill a plant, it's no big deal. If I do something with my horse, it's a much bigger deal. Um, but I, I noticed, I was so aware of how long it took, which for me is unusual because, I, I mean, I, I, it, but it was fascinating to self-observe. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that, that zone that feels good, the all is well state, that can change from day to day or situation to situation. Right. So in that all is well zone, that no, that normal range or that that uh, range of tolerance, that can change depending on what else is going on in your day or the horse's day, um, what it is. You know, my my visits to the dentist make my limit of tolerance. I'm I'm much more nervous about things, right, than when I'm hanging out in my garden, for example, or something like that. So it varies, and what might be scary for me is not scary for you. So it's really important to kind of look at the situation and, and look at your own self and go, gosh, isn't this interesting? When I see stuff, it's kind of like, that's really interesting, you know? Not, why am I so stupid that I'm responding? It's just like, oh, look at me. Look what's going on. This is really interesting. <laughs> and you can say hi to yourself, right? And you kind of go, here I am. Yeah, and, you know, I think within that, one of the things that's important is not to have the expectation of being the same all the time, that we exactly. are going to have highs and lows, and it's unrealistic, in fact, delusional, to think that we're going to stay on this even plane. Um, but I think some people have a little more highs and lows than others, but, you know, like for me this morning, I was so frustrated dealing with uh, you know, GoDaddy, and 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 de I was at the dentist yesterday and trying to file the claims, and and so yeah, I know, and I, I haven't been able to get out in my garden yet, so that's why this talk is really important for me right now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be different from day to day, yeah. right? And to and to just acknowledge yourself and go, wow, that, it's so interesting being human, and yeah. a lot of horses the same thing. It's so interesting that they're real beings that have experiences and they have a life and and they vary day to day just like they we vary do. day to day yeah could be Absolutely. the weather could be they didn't sleep i had horses once that didn't sleep well and boy were they not wanting to talk to me um, <laughs> yeah i'd taken them to uh i was doing a clinic in tennessee but there was a tennessee worker horse show going on that night and they start at 10 and end at 2 in the morning and so when i came back after being at the hotel overnight I was fully rested and they were really, really unhappy. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of like meeting your horse where your horse is at, meeting, coming where you're at and offering yourself ways to kind of arrive. And that's, that's part of it. Like we can be like really excited and all over the map, but the, the focus of this talk is if I want to then be calm or be somebody my horse actually wants to be around, there are ways that I can help myself do that. <laughs> Because the big thing is if I arrive and I'm like this, right? And my horse is going to take one look at me and kind of go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then she's going to do what she needs to do just to sort of stay, either do her job or to get out of the situation as fast as possible or basically tune me out as much as she is able to <laughs> until I turn into a normal piece, you know, somebody she actually wants to be around or my, any horse that I'm working with. So that's, that's the big thing about how can we be calm in a way that's not a freeze? How can we come into the place that feels good and feels good to be around? So that's what's next here. Any comments or questions from anyone? I'm not following. Uh, so them. far people, um, Anna Newman loved a phrase, but please Anna, tell me what phrase it was because it didn't register with me and I'd love to know what it was. Uh, okay, I'm going back to screen share. You guys can see that? Uh, yeah. Isn't that a nice picture? It's lovely and it's very My favorite cool. colors. Yes. So what are the things that can help to calm us if we want to be calm? You know, it's sort of like, I want to be calm. What are some things physiologically that can help us? Because it doesn't matter what you think. Your body believes what it feels. So I might decide in my head and have the affirmation, I am perfectly fine. <laughs> I am calm, right? And your body's having none of it. 
And then you've got this, you have to really look at what is my body saying? Because especially with animals, the animals read our physiology and they read our body. And they're sort of going, oh no, you know, she's thinking one thing and doing something else. I have to figure out those two things. This is going to be tricky. Or, oh good, my, my, my person's a little clearer today, a little easier to be around. This is a nice thing, right? Yep. So here we go. One of the big things. Exhale. As soon as you find yourself ramping up or you want to or you want to just sort of land in something a bit more calm, exhale. And there's an interesting difference between you ex whether you exhale into the collapse, which is a free state, or where you can land on something where you feel the ground under your feet and you feel yourself. And the exhale is interesting because the exhale is regulated by your parasympathetic or slowing down nervous system. The inhale is regulated by your sympathetic nervous system. Right, so the inhale revs you up, exhale slows you down, and then sense where you land when you do your exhale. <sighs> land on something that feels good, that lets you feel like you're connected to the ground or in your bones somehow. And others will sense where you land. So a lot of the time when you're working and when the, you know, Robin or the, the um, Tellington Touch people are working, we'll breathe out as we're working with the horse or any time I want to sort of slow down the situation or slow down myself or just give myself a break and give the horse a break or the dog or whoever I'm working with. I just breathe out. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's uh, with Robin, when Robin's working, it's, you hear it and it's very noticeable, but in a positive way, you, you yeah. absolutely acknowledge it. And with Sharon Wilsey's work with Horse Speak, she talks about different types of breath with horses, but uh, definitely this idea of a calming breath is a big piece of the Horse Speak. So it's nice to see this connection that that exhale is, ha has a biological meaning. Yeah, and you'll notice as well, when something feels safe or after trying really hard on something and you get to stop, often our body will spontaneously breathe in and breathe out. Mm -hmm. There will be a big breath and that's an indicator that stuff is, there's some movement going on, right? That there's a connection through, that there's an ability to release. And your horse, if you're working with a horse or other humans, will feel where you land. They'll feel whether you're in the collapse, which is like the sigh and the dejection, or if you're in this state. And when you come into the place that's got support, we radiate, you know, from our different nerve complexes, we have three, we have big ones. We have, you know, one in the head, a big one around all the parasymp the, the, the ventral vagus nerve cluster and all that here, another one around our gut. We radiate information about ourselves from those places. And those can, that can be picked up by, by electromagnetic, um, you know, ECGs and things like that can feel the stuff from our heart complex. So we radiate information about our state and others pick it up. And clearly our horses know. When I'm here, I'm different than if I'm here or somewhere else, right? Yep. It's like, oh, there you are. <laughs> and sometimes it requires our horses to give us the feedback for us to recognize where we are. Yeah. Like sometimes we're just so in, in the moment of, of whatever anxiety level it is that we don't realize it. But then we get around our dog or our cat or our horses. With people, we have other issues and the interaction shifts. And so I don't think it's as clear as when we get around the horses and they're like, uh-uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you gotta yeah. do something, you gotta change your state of being. Yeah. And so this, the exhale is one part of changing the state. Another big part is to arrive. And this is really key. It's sort of like, okay, I've, I've come to the barn, I've come out to the field, or I'm about to work with a dog, or I'm coming in to do a Feldenkrais session with someone, or someone's coming to me. Breathe out, drop my drama from around me, and become present here. I like so I can drop here. my drama from, drop my drama, I should, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Drop my drama, you know, because it's not your drama, it's mine. And it's not about what we're doing here. So I can, if I can clear that out, let's sort of say I'm going to shift out of my business and I'm going to be here now with you and just go, hi. You know, that, that shifts everything as well. That suddenly my horse 
when I stop fussing and being busy, the animals I'm around will often then, it's like the weather changes. Right. Right. It's like the weather around us changes and therefore the capacity to notice us or relate to us is different for the animal that we're working with. You know, even you putting up this screen and those trees, I could feel my nervous system calm down. Yeah. Just, just that image alone. Um, yeah. So fascinating. You know, having an image like this where you just sort of think, like in the forest, you know, or something like that, where you just have whatever it is that gives you the space and lets you kind of arrive. Yeah. It's so useful and it's felt. You know, when I arrive with it, if, if I'm with someone who's not with me, it's really obvious. Um, when I'm with, when I am with someone, there's a, there's a very interesting big old horse that would watch my mare and me leave out of, the, out of the field and he'd just stand there and he'd watch us and he'd just go, hi, right? And he'd watch us come back and then he'd continue to just say hi. And I asked an animal communicator once, is he trying to sort of tell us something? And she goes, hi. <laughs> right it's that simple and it was really clear he was with us it was great that's all it takes a high i think right. sometimes we we forget how simple things can be if we just get it down to sort of a uh you know it doesn't have to be complicated they don't need it all involved it's just sometimes the simpler is better yeah, and I find, you know, the simpler I can make it, the less fussy I have to be about, am I doing the right thing? It's like, breathe out, say hi. So, and then the relating, right? The parasympathetic, the, the vagus nerve, the newer vagus nerve helps us engage socially. And when we engage socially, it helps tap into that newer vagus nerve. Um, so by paying attention to the relating, we're bringing ourselves into the place where we can tap into that newer, nuanced, more versatile, better problem solving part of our nervous system. And the more we can listen to the whispers, the little tiny signals that are going on, the better the conversation. Because it's a lot nicer to chat with someone than to yell when things are over the top, right? And so it's finding out, can we have a conversation? So I love this photo of you working with this horse here yeah. and offering the mat. You know, you're offering the pad and asking the horse, what do you think? Yep. The horse gets to take its time. He gets to listen and kind of look at it and go, hmm, you know? And you're noticing and watching. There's time. We give ourselves time to ask and hear and see what's going on. So it isn't just sort of walking in, oh, this is good for you, right? Great, I'm gonna do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the big thing is if you notice concern, when you're listening to the whispers, if you notice signs of concern, and we want this to be a calm experience, change something, you know? It doesn't, it's not something where I have to say, oh, you're being a stupid horse, just do it. It's more, what can I do to make this better? How can I, mean, I make I this more interesting? Something. Some people think it has to be so big, but what I, what I keep finding with Surefoot is the change something, most of the time is just stop. Just yeah. stop and take another breath or another moment or just pause. I, I'm P-A-W-S, P-A-U-S-E. Just pause for even sometimes less than five seconds. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's like, it's just allowing that moment for this, system to acknowledge and then you're good you're good to go it doesn't have to be like like totally change what you're doing or just you know but sometimes it's just a just a few seconds of pause yep absolutely you know and it's and it's just listening to the horse like this picture in the bottom is me working with a horse who was like five years old or something and he was very nervous when i got there that day and he always needed something in his mouth but he was mouthy, you know, and he, it's just what he did. It was his fight flight thing, like fidgeting as a form of fight flight. Yep. I'm just going to do something so I can sort of manage this situation, right? So Robin it's a, calls it domesticated flight. And I've used that a lot as a term because I think it helps people understand. Yes. You know, it's very well-mannered flight kind of situation, fight flight situations, doing something because I can't get out of it, but I have to do something. And oh, by the way, you know, one of the, the things that we're supposed to do now during the pandemic is not touch our face, right? Not touch our face. 
and, and I just, you know, like, okay, so now I'm hyper aware of it, but we, I think we self medicate a lot by Dude. touching our face and do it, you know, and Linda Tellington Jones talks about like doing the lip work just here between the nose and the lip to calm because of the limbic system. But, you know, ever since they said that I, I've become so conscious of how much, you know, I either touch my face or want to touch my face. Yeah. <laughs> So then figure out, can you do it in a different, you know, like that's, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Right now I'm, I know that we're good here There's and so I can touch my face and, and I haven't touched yeah. anybody and I've washed my hands. So yes, but it, but it's fascinating as a, as a sort of self study to see how something that we do so unconsciously and so frequently is now something, you know, we're not supposed to do and just how the nervous system responds to that. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And what was interesting with this horse is that by the end of the session right here, he's got the rope just on the edge of his lips and he is just about to drop it. Oh yeah. So he got calm enough within about a minute after this, this was after working with him for a bit where it's like, okay, I don't need to do this anymore right now, which for me was a huge sign that the horse felt much safer. You know, and it was sort of, so it's an interesting way to just listen to the whispers, notice what they're telling us about what feels good, and helping them out, simple things. Help, just help them out with simple things. Step back, wait a second, move away, let them walk off, let them do things that just lets them feel safe. Right. There's, our other webinars talk a lot more about, you know, what are other things that they can do that makes them feel safe. Right. But this is sort of how to calm them. And then the pause, the stepping away and waiting, what you were just talking about there, right? So important to our nervous system. We need time without new stuff coming in for the gut, the old dorsal vagus nerve, to be able to sort of kick back and kind of go, hmm, right? Does this feel okay? And it's that part of the gut that gives you your gut feeling that goes up and down very quickly to the brain about this feels okay or it doesn't feel okay. It's not very discerning kind of, it doesn't give you a lot of details. It's not like here where you get lots of details in the ventral vagus. Down here, it's kind of this feel good, not feel good. But once you get the, the time to integrate and your body, all the parts within you, all your experiences tell you this is okay, that's when stuff integrates and that's when change can happen. And that's when you get the breath and that's when you get the change in body posture. And that's when you get the shifts that happen that you'll see, you see with the, you know, that we see with the working with the pads and working just quietly with a horse and giving them some time and some space in a way that feels good for them. And so this is really key, right? And it's just sort of, as you said, a few seconds or a little bit longer, give them a pause, give them a break. So the physiology can do its thing, the processing. And then Linda Tellington Jones talks about trusting the goodness in your hands. You don't need fancy stuff. Your presence, you are enough. You as an individual are enough to help make a difference in how the horse feels, how you feel, what's going on in here. And Linda talks about put your heart in your hands and your hands on your horse. And, or bring this to working with your horse. And here's Linda working with a horse doing mouth work there. And I think this is so key because sometimes we just don't trust, we think we have to do fancy things or do something, right? And it's like, you don't have to do much. Just show up and have goodness in your intention. You know, that, that makes me think again, and I mentioned this in another webinar that um, I apprenticed with Sally Swift back in 92. Um, and I met her in 86, actually Robin Hood and I did the instructor course with her together in Colorado. Um, and Sally had a scoliosis and later on she was on a cane and so she was unsteady and she hadn't really taken training in doing body work. So it wasn't like she had good technique. In fact, one might say that she had sort of mediocre technique, but, but the touch, the quality of touch that Sally had was life-changing. And I'll never forget when she, in Colorado, she put her hand on my left leg, which is where I've had all the injuries, and how absolutely overwhelmingly powerful that was. Um, and so, so often I think that we get caught up in the technique of something, which not to say that tech, improving technique isn't important. However, this whole idea of coming to it with the heartfeltness 
yes. uh, and Sally um, can so outweigh technique in those moments that it's yeah. not like you have to be able to know how to do all kinds of stuff with your horse, but the intention is so critical. The intention is so, the, having a heart and having a clear intention, again, that's where the arriving can, can be. You know, what's my intention with my horse? And so Laura Plunkett just said, and she's, she's right, she said this ties in with Dr. Stephen Peter's uh, webinars where um, the pause is allowing the dendrites. So he's talking about, you know, that when the horse is in that safe place, you've got serotonin and the serotonin is building the dendritic scaffolding to make the neural connections. Yeah. And the horse has to feel safe for that to happen. Yeah. They can build the connections through fight or flight thing too, but then that's a survival response that's going on. That's what's being reinforced. Right. So to, to bring in the new learning, to have any interest in learning something new, it's gotta be something, that if they're, they can learn interesting new stuff when they're not in a survival state. And then for survival state, they're only interested in learning stuff that helps them survive. You know, oh, that's- Say that again, that's very important. The nervous, in the survival state, your body's only interested in learning new things that are really useful to help you survive better. Right? So if you get a thoroughbred off the track that has had some negative experiences and you put him in another situation and you think he's learning, but he is stressed, he's only building more survival techniques. Yeah, he's, he's getting really good at surviving in your situation. Right, as opposed to actually helping him feel safe and therefore learn new possibilities and new patterns of movement. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of like, then your body becomes interested in the interesting things, you know, um, because they're interesting. But um, if you're in the survival state, the main thing that you're gonna to wanna to learn about is can this help me survive better? Yep. So we have a question here. Um, um, is the reference to new and old vagal nerves just referring to the research or rather uh, referring to the chronolo chronological development? It's in the, it's in the development. I forget the name if it's ETL, whatever it is. It's like over evolution, course of evolution. Mammals, up until mammals, there was, you know, basically a parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system. So you had the on off switch. And you had sort of this, this grading between one and the other. What happened in mammals is because we rely on our parents to help raise us. There's this social engagement that needs to happen. So there's a connection that stays and my parent connects with me for a long period of time. It's a biological imperative to have that. And um, there's sort of this, uh, a need for different kind of problem solving. So there was a new branch a parasympathetic function that develops that's in mammals that's not in fish that's not in birds that's not in insects they don't have that right so it's and it's almost like this new parasympathetic branch in, in one of my other talks it's like you're on a bridge and you get a sympathetic arousal and you're up on top of the bridge and then you're going to come down either to one side of the parasympathetic nervous system or the other side and they are two different countries that feel really different and they function differently in the body. One is sort of the fight or the, the free state, the calming, you know, slowing down into freeze, and the other one is the calming into rest, digest, recover, learn, do all those good things in life state, the, the, the I, feel, I feel safe state, right? So that's, the, they sort of regulate two different types of functions overall. There's some crossover branching that happens, but that's the main function of those two different branches of the vagus nerve. So one is, is newer evolutionary, evolutionary, evolutionarily. Oh, there you go, that word. <laughs> I can do that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what happens is that there's thought to be normally sort of a cascading, as things get tough, uh, in mammals, we'll first access the problem solving, newer branch and do all that stuff. And then when that's not working, when things are too scary or too big or too overwhelming, we go into the older biological responses that are shared with all different types of creatures, right? So we get the fight flight kind of response. And then if that doesn't work or sometimes right away, um, you know, like the bracing or whatever, it's just a response, we go into a freeze, freeze state. So the freeze state can 
be the final thing that happens, like if you're a gazelle being chased by a lion and you faint. We've seen, seen the photos or, you know, where, animal, where uh, gazelles faint and then all of a sudden they jump up and run away. Yep. And it's like, okay, they went into a deep freeze so they could deal with that situation and then their, their fight flight kicked back in, they were able to run away. Then they'll probably do whatever their body does to sort of get that out of their system then they can return to uh, to grazing and stuff. And that's the interesting, the um, getting it out of your system, the shaking it off. Yeah. So there might be shaking, there might be other things. There are, there's a lot of different ways that it can, we can move it through our system. One of the things that sometimes shows up is the shaking that you'll see. So that in animals, they may shake. Um, and that's a discharge of excess energy that's in here, of excess stuff. So they can get, get into a state that, that feels safe and normal and okay for them then again. Alrighty. So one thing that puts this all together and we can, you can do it on your horse, on the front of their chest or anytime you're sitting on the horse and you can do it to yourself anytime. Going into the dentist, you know, waiting for, you know, if I get the hiccups um, or these funny little flutters I sometimes get, I'll do this. And Linda Tellington Jones taught this in South Africa to groups of orphans as a way to self soothe or as a way to calm our nervous system. If you get acid reflux, this can make a difference. It touches into the neural complex that's in the middle of your chest here, that touches into your mediastinum, which covers everything. It covers your lungs and your heart and everything in there. So it touches all of you in there and it just feels good. So you don't have to know any of that, but I wanna show everybody this. Okay, so you're gonna make your screen big, right? Yes, I will come around. Um, while you're doing that, we have a quick question from Elizabeth, as she said, I've read that learning cannot happen in the presence of fear or pain. Is that a vagal nerve issue? Well, the vagus nerve is, the vag the vagus nerve is, is busy then. Basically, it's a survival stress issue, right? Your body's in survival mode. And it's sort of like, that's what matters most. And then the new learning doesn't get a chance to sink in. Robin talks about the slots are full. There's only so many little slots in your brain that are open for learning. And when they're busy, Nothing new is going to sink in. It's just going to whiz right past. Oh, well, that's a great analogy. Yeah. And it's like everything just goes in one ear, out the other. And why would it stick? Because I'm busy. Right. You know, this is not relevant to what matters most to me in my physiology right now. Right. And that's why you'll get people, too, when you're teaching them. And they're, they're, they're worried about their lesson or about something. And they're kind of like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and two minutes later, you, you get them to do it. It's like... Do what? <laughs> you, know, you did that so well. The whole look, everything, that was perfect. I can tell you so many students that when I started, they, they're like that. In the beginning, they're, they're so uncertain and their whole nervous system is so alarmed of being in a strange environment, having to learn something new, what's going to happen. And that, this, you emulated it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, there's a real drive or desire to be compliant. Right. right? It's obedience and compliance and doing your best, right? And that state, when it's in a state of being worried, there's not much that sticks. Right. And it's just, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble and do the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> and our horses are like that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is it, the... Uh, Okay, I'll just let you monitor the, the comments yeah. there. Yeah, but, but somebody's saying, um, but on a 1,200 pounds of free thinking beast. So yeah, we don't want them in that state of, I'm just like trying to cope here because they might have to react in a way that's a lot more violent than. But a lot of our training techniques actually ask them to do that. So when we're desensitizing mm. in a way where we are teaching the horse, just suck it up and stand still. No matter what I do around you, I want you to suck it up and stand still. We're teaching them to go into freeze. And then as soon as they come out of freeze, they're going to be worried, right? Or they're going to think working with me is, oh, no, here comes the crazy lady. Well, and this is, this is the distinction that is so important for people to understand that compliance does not mean learn. No. That compliance is simply that, that they know that this is, they have to tolerate whatever is happening for the length of time that it's going on. But it doesn't mean that it's going to make them better at making associations in the world. It actually uh, causes the opposite where 
now they can't make associations and everything is new and they have to learn, well not learn, but they have to become tolerant of each individual thing as opposed to being able to make associations. Yeah. This is a pen, this is a pen, this is a pen. They all are different, but they're all pens. When you're in that uh, other state, they don't, you can't relate to them as the same thing. That's right, yeah. And, and uh, the whole sense of partnership is really different. If I have an obedient horse, that can be very different than I having an engaged, an engaged, a horse that's engaged with me and is a thinking horse. Right. You know, and, and in the Tollington Touch, we're talking about we want our horses to learn to experience figuring out something new with us in a way where it's an interesting experience to do it, where you're in that zone of tolerance, where you can have interest and maybe you have a little peek outside of it and then you can come back into what feels safe. And then the horse's experience is, oh, I can have an experience where I'm learning something new, it's a bit exciting, and I get back to something safe, rather than I just have to blank it out and suck it up. Yeah, and Dr. Peters, I'm trying to remember the word that he used, but he talked about, resil I think it's resiliency. You know, the horse is more resilient when they've learned things, and they might be faced with something new, but because yep. they've been engaged in learning, they're resilient, and they can adapt and adjust. But if they're in that other state of, to just tolerating they don't have any resilience they don't yeah. the resilience is part of the new vagus nerve right it's problems it has a capacity to problem solve to think things through to make connections oh this is sort of like something i did over there or oh i figured out something tricky before i can figure out something tricky again even right. the process of figuring out something tricky if it's new you know when, when a horse sees a new hay bale sitting in the middle of the the corral you know ha thing right is it this a major issue or do they go oh it's a hay bale it's okay i can walk past it <laughs> yeah, you know and i can remember i think trail class is probably the place that's the best example is that when you see a horse in a trail class competition that's really understands their job the confidence and the ability to just simply march up to whatever it is perform the task and go on there's no fluff there's no must there's it's just I've got it, right? The horse is like, oh, good. I don't know that one, but I've got it. I've done something similar. Whereas yeah. the horse that's been, quote unquote, desensitized or is in slush or freeze or stress, they can't do that. Yeah. They can't just calmly relax and stand at the obstacle. There's always an intent, you know, like a little dancing around or a little nervousness or a little sticky spot. They just can't quietly move through the trail. And I think. Yeah, and they can have the sticky spot. It's the question is, how quickly do they come? into a place of, oh, that's what it is. Right. You know, like my horse spooks a lot, but she spooks and then she stops and she looks at it. You know, and then we go, oh, that was a fluffy little bird that jumped up, you know, this ptarmigan up in the Yukon. There would be ptarmigan in the snow and you wouldn't see them until you're four feet away from them. All of a sudden they bomb out of the snow and they make this big, and you know, and so the first time this happened, my horse almost jumps on top of We're walking. She almost jumps into my arms. I almost jump into hers. And then we look at each other and we go, it was a fluffy little bird. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, yeah. Okay. Marion <laughs> has, a, has a question, and it's a little confusing, but I think I can understand it. She says that after faint, the lion that was interrupted by odd behavior, question mark, why didn't pounce and kill, question mark, if interrupted was faint or ploy? Um, well, it's not a stupid question, but I think it's a little confused. Like, I've been to Africa. I take people on safari to Africa. And I'll never forget this one time we were watching three lionesses. They were going to uh, go after some wildebeest. And it was starting to rain, which was perfect because the wildebeest hunker down and put their butt to the wind. And so that sets them up for the lions. But then this group of hyena came by. Yeah. Right? And they just wandered by and they weren't interested in, in hunting. They were just passing through and they disrupted the herd. And the lions, you could see them go, oh, <laughs> not tonight. Um, so, you know, the disruption often, like if your cat misses, you know, my cats complain if they miss something, they're like, rah, 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 you know, they have to talk about it. Um, but, you know, life gets disrupted. That's part of the process. Not every hunt is a kill. And so, you know, you might start after a gazelle or something, and then either something veers off or gets distracted, and you're just like, oh, yeah. And the game does the same thing. They might see a lion and, and freeze but the lion's not interested in them and keeps it going. And so suddenly you see them come out of freeze and they just run. Yeah. Um, well, there's National Geographic footage actually of lions. A lion took down a, a, a gazelle 
some hyenas came along, the lion left the gazelle to go to hyenas and chase them off, at which point the gazelle jumps up and runs away, yeah. right? So it's, it's like the useful responses within us and our biology, can, and it's not a choice. Right. You know? the and National Geographic typically hyenas. only shows you the moments when something's happening, but I've been on safari now. I, I've gone eight different times to Kenya and uh, probably a dozen times altogether. And I've never seen it. Uh, I've seen one kill. I've seen one actual hunt and kill in that entire time. Yeah. So a lot of times it's super peaceful out there and yeah. we just see the condensed. Yeah. Part of what goes on, right? And I think um, the, the other key thing about the fight, flight and freeze responses is they are not a choice. Yeah, it's the biology that, sorry, I tapped my table. Uh, it's the biology that kicks in. <laughs> when the going gets tough, your biology takes over to take care of you. Right. That's, you know, it's an older evolutionary, evolutionary um, capacity within us that's in our biology. We're wired that way. And I think this is where we can also think about the Feldenkrais method in resiliency in that he used to say that, you know, health is the ability to recover. So. Yeah. You know, the more different experiences we have of having a dangerous situation that we worked our way out of or, um, you know, being challenged in moderate but appropriate levels, we build resiliency and we can evaluate, okay, this is something I need to really be worried about. This is something that's okay. Yeah. Um, and then that takes us to David Butler's work, Explain Plain, where the question is, is it dangerous? Yes. And so we have to be kind of having that dialogue of, uh, because sometimes we might think it's a really dangerous situation, but if we ask the question, we go, oh, actually, I'm okay. And so we don't have to go into those more instinctive reactions of yes. freeze or whatever. Yeah, and that's, that's, the over, that's our newer brain kicking in and going, okay, let's just assess for a moment and then deciding, right? So sometimes we'll have the initial response, the spook, right? And then the through the experience, we get the chance of the thinking brain to come in or the, the whole self to come in and go, right, it's, it's your, your trail class horses. Yeah. Taking it out quickly. And or also that social engagement piece where we can look around at others around us and see how they're responding and recognize, oh, I really should be worried or nah, it's okay. Yeah, and so all these, these calming things here, if, we find, if I find myself getting wound up in a situation, I will go through these things, I will breathe out. Yep. I will step back and I'll say, hi, sorry about that. I was having a moment. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we actually, and that's where our thinking brain is so nice because it actually gives us the opportunity to in, intellectually reset our system. Yeah. Yep. And the more we do that, the better we get at it, the quicker it happens. That whole ability to, to reset happens quicker and quicker as we, as we experience in our own self that it works and it's safe. Right, so avoiding any stressful situation is actually not positive because then we don't have the, the learning of how to cope with situations. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it, again, it's a, it's a question of degree. We'd like to just have a little over the line learn and come back down and realize that we can be resilient and we, that's not dangerous versus blowing way out of it and then obviously. Yeah. Yeah, or staying there. Right. You know, the real trick is if you end up staying there because it's just a high stress situation to be in. And so your coping mechanism is either to stay revved up really high or going to freeze. So that brings us to our current situation where some of us have been in lockdown now for two months. Um, and not everyone has the ability to get out to get to their horses or get to their garden or be around nature. I mean, I live in a rural county. I'm, I'm really lucky in that way that's only 130 people in my town. Right now it feels like a ghost town because we have a very famous three-star Michelin restaurant that's shuttered. Um, so it's very quiet in town. Um, but on the weekends, it's uh, almost frightening because all the motorcycles come out of DC and right. zoom up and there's been motorcycle accidents and it sounds like a racetrack outside. But again, I'm lucky because I can get out in nature. So how about the people that are, uh, are experiencing this situation that can't do that? How are they, what are some tips or something that we can suggest to them to help them be able to maintain and you know, establish that calming in themselves right now? Well, it's, it's being able to say hello to your own experience. Go, hi. Oh, I get it, right? 
there's a lot going on here, right? All this stuff. And actually, the heart hug, which I'll show in a minute, is a way to sort of come back to yourself and just say hello to yourself. It's, it's having the ability to just say hi to your own experience is, is huge. If nobody else is able to say hi to your experience for you, if you can say hi to your own experience and just kind of go, here I am being human, yeah. you know? And I can be curious about where I am. I can bring it, like the curiosity brings online the ventral vagus. If I can be curious about, oh, look, I'm having this big gut response of fright or something going on. And, and simply by noticing and being curious, you start into the, the place of noticing and, and of engaging in this differently. Right? So do you think how that's how the surefoot pads are working for the horses? That it's making them notice and therefore resetting their system? Could be. I mean, it's something novel and interesting that shows up that's not scary. Right. As as they figure out it's not scary. Yeah, because that's the thing, I, I think you'll agree with me, that one of the things we really see with horses standing on surefoot pads is that they calm down. It appears that they reset their nervous system, that they get into this better state of being. And in some ways, they almost, some of them almost look too low, but that's where Martina talked about just keeping track of the breathing and the heart rate to make sure they're not in the danger zone of too low. But I've rarely seen a horse go there. Um, yeah. but, we see this whole calming effect and it's lasting. Um, and, you know, I mean, if people have surefoot pads at home, it might be worthwhile for you to stand on them yourselves during this time or when you put your horses on so that the two of you are sort of um, becoming in the same state of being and allowing the effect of the pads for the horses to also help you. Yeah. And just even noticing your feet on the ground, one of the things that does help um, is noticing it's called orienting into here and now basically become tactile notice your sensations of your butt touching your chair and your chair meeting your butt so the environment gets to meet you and you're meeting your environment there and just notice oh my butt's on the chair and the chair is under my butt <sighs> breathe out i actually like spend a lot of time walking around barefoot and walk feel your feet on the ground and feel the ground meet your feet how do you meet the ground Right? Just become curious about that tactile sensation because that will often bring you back into present time, present place, and are you okay right here, right now, physically, physiologically. So that would also explain how the Feldenkrais method has such a deep effect on the nervous system because in Feldenkrais awareness from uh, functional integration, that the private lesson part where you're working with a practitioner, it's literally hands-on. They're literally touching your body and moving it. And so it, in a way, it's that self-defining where you are in space proprioceptively. Yep. Um, you, can touch, you can do anything you want. You can touch yourself. If, if you're finding that you're <laughs> I have to be careful how we say that. Careful. Okay. Yes. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can, you know, notice your arms. You can, you can just slap your arms, slap your thighs, anything like that to get a sensation going of here I am, right here. And I am, I am in I this am. room. I can <laughs> see the yellow on the wall. I can see the square frame, right? It's sort of like real sensory presence. So you and come back you into those like, sensory things. Uh, you know, like if you had a flower and you just literally just felt each petal of the flower yeah. gently enough not to bruise it, but to feel it, that would heighten your sense of touch and reduce the effort so that you up the sensitivity level yeah. to make it even more powerful. Because sometimes when people touch, I, yeah. you know, I watch them in my clinics and I say, you know, put your hands on your hip and they're like, I can't feel it. Well, you can't feel anything when you're putting that much effort into it. You have to really reduce the effort and feel lightly, which is where all the Tellington touches grade the quality of touch into a scale of one to 10 so that you're really working on a light, sensitive level. And this goes back to, and we'll have next week, Dr. Sybil Mole talking about kinesio tape and taping horses where the, the tape isn't strong or heavy, it's just making these tactile connections. And, and probably, um, I'm gonna conjecture, it's also affecting the fascia. And that lighter touch has a, uh, be more effective in terms of affecting the fascia, which Dr. Um, Neerthart talked about as being more primitive than our nervous system, but acting as a nervous system that's even more primitive. So here we are 
most likely tapping into the fascial system, the nervous system, identifying yeah. where we are in space, giving it the message, every, all is well. It, it, I, I'm starting to see how all these different pieces keep shaping that ball. Yeah, and, and for, for here, you know, like if, if you're finding that you're getting overwhelmed by situations or whatever, the more you can breathe out, say hi to yourself, and if you need to, just trust your own hands and put your heart in your hands and your hands on your arm. Yeah. Right? Or your, on your kneecaps or something and just say hi. Yeah. Feel the ground under your feet or the chair under your butt. In that way, it's something where it comes out of this, which has a lot to do with what's going on up here in your brain, right? And into right here, in the right now. Yep. The Keep present. it simple. Yeah. Keep it back into here. Help your horse that way. Help yourself that way. Yeah, that's awesome. And so the, 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 the heart hug, which is lovely. It's a, oh, yeah. another I'm going to make your screen big for that. Okay, hang on. Mm -mm -mm. Spotlight video. There you go. Okay. So the heart hug is um, tapping into all the goodness that's in, in your whole self, right? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Linda um, learned about heart math. And so the heart hug actually came out of uh, learning about heart math and the whole heart connection and coherence and all that. Isn't that right? I'm not sure if the heart hug came from that or not. It might have. Okay, I, I can find out. It certainly okay. worked with it, right? This yeah. whole sense of... I know that she talks a lot about heart math. Yeah, yeah. She's done a lot of work with the Heart Math Institute and with, with um, calming. And the, re the reason I bring that up is that there's real science behind this. Absolutely. It's just some woo-woo. Yeah, and so Kathy Kane, who, who's developed the work, uh, she's the Somatic Experiencing Master Instructor and does her own body work, uh, body stuff now too. She uses something very similar to tap into and connect with the whole mediastinum. Eleanor Silverstein, who does, you know, Tellington Touch and Feldenkrais and Horsey stuff and so on. She uses this with reflex, with all sorts of things that are going on. It just says hi to your, your whole self. Yep. It says hi to your heart metaphorically and it says hi to your whole self physically because it connects to all the tissues all the fascia that connects through right and the interesting thing about fascia is if you, if you touch it one place you'll feel it anywhere else it's like uh, you know an osteopath friend of mine said it's like pantyhose if you're wearing pantyhose if you pull them up to your armpits you'll feel it in your baby toe <laughs> <laughs> it's like got it got the image <laughs> okay so you just place your hand over top of somewhere on your ribs another hand on top and then you make a circle of the skin and it's starting from the bottom so you get to lift the skin a little bit go whichever direction feels best you just make a circle and a quarter and then you let it go and it just sits for a moment and you breathe And then you can do another one if you want to. Just moving the skin as so I'm not sliding my hand around. I'm just moving the skin a little bit. I'm just saying, hello. Hello, self. And then I let my hand settle and just wait for a sec. And that's interesting how rapidly it influences the breathing. Interesting. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's, yeah. And you can do this on your horse too. And you can do it like once, two, maybe three times. That's it. You can do it anytime, anywhere. We do it automatically when things get off and we'll yeah. put our hands here when yeah. we get, when we get <laughs> it's sort of like just. It's it doing go. it consciously as opposed to unconsciously, really. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and you um, can do it on your, you can put it on the, on the chest of your horse, right? If you want to have your horse calm. Or you can just have your hand anywhere on the horse or you can do it on your, your own self and your horse is going to feel it. Right. You've had lots of stuff on the, on the, the um, surefoots where one horse is busy having a great experience and the other horse comes over and stands beside them yeah. and just takes it all in by osmosis, right? Yep. So the other, your horse will pick it up if it's in you, they'll get it. Yep. And this is, uh, Laura Wilsey was talking about, not Laura Wilsey, I confused two names, Laura Plunkett. <laughs> They're all blending now. Um, Laura Plunkett was talking about, you know, this whole idea of just putting a hand uh, on the horse's chest and a hand on the withers and just holding, but you could do a nice little skin moving circle, just the same. Yeah, 
all you're doing is this tiny little idea even of hi. Yeah. And if you forget about the circle, just put your hand there and just say yeah. hi. Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte. <laughs> Just a sec, I'll, I'll just share one final, final little thingy here. Okay. I get called Charlotte a lot, so there you go. And, and, and Olive. Wow, that's so wild, because it was just like past life stuff, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so this is such a lovely photo of you, because you're just hanging out with this horse, and this horse is hanging out with you. Yeah, oh, that was, that was in Colorado. That was Amy Lestat's mayor that would not allow herself to be caught. And Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, no, I got it on the brain. Amy brought her to the Surefoot workshop that I was doing there, and she purposely didn't touch her before she brought her to the workshop because she'd come back. It was a mare that she'd bred and sold, and the mare came back, and she was, you couldn't catch her in the field. So she was just in the round pen, and I just worked with her in the round pen, and at first she wouldn't let me come near her, but that's, that's a great, I'm so pleased to see that picture. That's just a, um, and that it, mare the next day was coming right goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And it just exuded the, the simple stuff, right? Just yeah. be with her, be with yourself, be with her, say hi, listen. And then if anything's indicating concern, just change something so that it's a little easier in there, right? And just see what happens. Yeah. That That's makes it. me smile. Thank you, Violet. So there you go. And it's, you know, if anybody's got any questions or wants to get in touch with me, here's my email address, my website. I'm happy to talk to anybody about this. And this is my big black mare, Shiraz. And um, Violet's a Surefoot practitioner, and you can find that photo of her on the Surefoot Equine website under Practitioners in Canada. Um, it's a great picture. I love it. Yep. Yeah, that's her in her glory. Yep. She's a big spirit, a big old spirit. All right, I'm just going to check real quick. It looks like we might have a, a question or two here. Oh, you're a hoot, Violet, is what somebody said. <laughs> um, uh, Elizabeth Vander is saying a psychologist by the name of Dr. Tara Bach, Brock works with people dealing with anxiety. She says that the act of physically putting your hand on your heart is vital to coming to peace. There's a network of neurons in the heart area. And when there's warmth and pressure on it, it actually calms the sympathetic nervous system and reduces the fear centers in the brain. And that's from the New York Times, that quote. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that the more like we see research like heart math and this kind of thing, and we start to under, understand the polyvagal theory, again, it's like we're, we're gathering more and more information to make this be more of a clear puzzle with a very defined edges and very defined picture that there are some, really simple things we can do to calm ourselves down and be at peace and therefore see that our horses respond to that. Yeah, and it's, it's like the magic. We know the magic works. Yep. Now we're making sense of the magic and sort of why it works, but you don't have to get into the why to just let the magic work. <laughs> and we have one more great, I think this is a fabulous question. Um, Somebody said, nine days before she gets to see her horse, Toby, will my mask be an issue? And I'd just like to say, two things about that. One, you can already be picturing seeing your horse and showing him in your mind's eye, your, you know, like look in the mirror and see what you look like with a mask and be just projecting that to your horse so that he's already, whether, it, whether it's real or not, it doesn't matter, but that you're already putting that out there that this is still you. Yeah. And they have a tremendous sense of smell and hearing. They will absolutely know your smell and your voice. So I'm positive that he will recognize you. Well, and horses are pretty smart at figuring out humans, right? Humans do a lot of weird things. They come with hats, they come with jackets, they come with other things. It's like, oh, there's my human. Look, <laughs> she's got that thing on, right? And if you still make yourself feel your presence, your intention, your, your, your you show up, the horse will notice you, the you, right. not the mask. Right, yeah. absolutely. Well, um, Violet, this has been, again, fascinating and fabulous. I, I so enjoy talking to you, and the hour flies by. It's actually been more than an hour. And, um, and it's just great to see you, and hopefully we'll get to see each other in physical presence again sometime soon. That was so much fun last summer at um, Robbins. I really want to repeat that. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, all the webinars, again, can be found in the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. If you want to get the links to all of the next week's webinars, just join my email list. Go to murdochmethod.com and register to get my email so that you get the first um, email that comes out because space is limited in, in these webinars. 
and we're running a special right now because it's uh, Muzzle Madness Month. The grass is growing here like crazy. So we have a special on the website. You can get 30% off the Harmony Humane Muzzles. Um, just go check that out at murdochmethod.com slash shop. Um, thank you once again, and it's been a pleasure, and thank you everybody for joining us, and um, until tomorrow, tomorrow I have another webinar on Surefoot at one o'clock, so we'll see you all there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Wendy. Hey, it was so fun. Take care. Bye. <laughs>